Last Sunday's gospel found us with the baby Jesus in the arms of Mary in Bethlehem, adored by the wise men from the east. Today's gospel finds the same Jesus of Nazareth 30, 30 years later, now grown to manhood on the banks of the River Jordan beginning his public ministry. John the Baptist, the last in the long line of Old Testament prophets, is face to face with him, about whom we heard in our first lesson, prophesied by Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased, upon whom I have put my spirit. He shall bring forth justice to the nations. What has brought this about? Why has the second person of the Holy Trinity been born of a virgin named Mary? Why would God become man? What would make all of this in some sense necessary? By way of getting at answers to these questions, I begin by quoting an Orthodox theologian who wrote, the Christian understanding of evil has always been more radical and fantastic than most will allow. Perhaps no doctrine is more insufferably fabulous to non-Christians than the claim that we exist in the long melancholy aftermath of a primordial catastrophe, that this is a broken and wounded world, and that the universe languishes in bondage to powers and principalities spiritual and terrestrial, alien to God. And as a consequence, he goes on to observe that in the gospel, the incarnate God enters a world at once his own and yet hostile to him. Then he quotes from John's gospel. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. And his appearance, he goes on to say, Within this cosmos, his cosmos, is both an act of judgment and a rescue of the beauties of creation from the torments of fallen nature. In short, this is his description of the reality of what in the West has been called original sin and then its effects on our world and our lives in it. Concerning this primordial catastrophe of original sin, drawing upon our Catholic catechism, we read, Adam and Eve transmitted to their descendants human nature wounded by their own first sin, and hence deprived of original holiness and justice. This deprivation is called original sin. As a result of original sin, human nature is weakened in its powers subject to ignorance, suffering, and the domination of death, and inclined to sin. The Catechism goes on to teach. We therefore hold with the Council of Trent that original sin is transmitted with human nature by propagation, not by imitation. And herein lie the answers to our questions being what has brought this about? Why has the second person of the Holy Trinity been born of a virgin named Mary? Why would God become man? What would make all of this in some sense necessary? For our Lord was born of the Virgin Mary to deal with this primordial catastrophe, original sin. This is why God became man, as Thomas Aquinas demonstrates eloquently in his Summa Theologiae. This is why he, as the second person of the Holy Trinity, was born of the Virgin Mary. And that is why, or that is what, more accurately, has brought this about. This is what, if we were to be saved, was absolutely necessary, not optional. And this is why he is standing before John the Baptist in today's gospel, where we have just heard, read, and read. 
after all the people had been baptized, and Jesus also had been baptized, and was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in a bodily form like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Matthew's account, which was written before Luke, augments Luke's with a very important interaction between John the Baptist and Jesus standing there in the Jordan River. John the Baptist says to him, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me. In this remark, this question, there is revealed a profound sense of inadequacy on John's part. And that profound sense of inadequacy is rooted in his recognition of two things, two realities. First, who God truly is, the high and holy one that inhabiteth eternity, before whose faith heaven and earth flee away, the one who cannot and will not behold iniquity. Then secondly, even though he, that is John, is a prophet and a righteous man and has been set apart for that purpose from his birth, indeed from his conception, he is nevertheless overwhelmed by his own sinfulness. His sinfulness in the midst of this fallen world, which flows from the primordial catastrophe, original sin, which has become overwhelmingly real to him, standing as he is, face to face, with the incarnate God. One is reminded of Isaiah's vision, having seen the thrice holy one. He says, I am a man of unclean lips, in the midst of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the Lord. To John's reluctance, Jesus replies in a very, very important statement. Allow it, that is, his baptism, that which was he, he was allowing himself to partake in. Allow it now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And another translation reads, for so it becometh us to fulfill justice, or all justice. <clears throat> The word which is translated in the one hand, on the one hand righteousness and on the other hand justice is the same Greek word, dikaiusune, and it can be used in either sense. Usually when we speak of righteousness, we think and are referring to a state that is the one who is righteous. Righteousness being an attribute of a holy one or a holy life. On the other hand, when we speak of justice, normally we think of a standard, something quite a part of ourselves, although we can live a life which is just. Justice is the standard by which one is judged to be righteous or unrighteous, holy or unholy. It's the same word the two sides of one coin. In Jesus, both are in harmony, one with the other. Being sinless man, Jesus can act on our behalf before God. Being very God of very God, life from light, infinitely holy and righteous in both his human and divine natures, his action, his sinless life, had and has infinite merit and is in complete harmony with the Holy One, his Heavenly Father, who is infinitely just, infinitely righteous, infinitely holy. And he is, therefore, the one who can not only make satisfaction for our sins, our sinful acts, which are so numerous we can't number them, but also for the tragic fact that because of original sin, 
We are born sinners. Jesus Christ is the one by whom and by whose sacrifice alone the guilt of original sin is washed away and our particular sins can be forgiven. By virtue of this one who is holy, alas, our justice, our righteousness, this day in the River Jordan, looking forward to the sacrifice of the cross, a fountain is opened, which makes glad the city of God. Our Lord, he who stands in our stead, this day sanctifies, makes holy the waters of baptism, which from the cross of Calvary will flow from his wounded side. <clears throat> Upon that cross, he shall seal the power of these waters. From his pierced side shall flow perpetually the water and the blood, alas, the water made holy by his precious blood. So that being baptized into the just one, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we might be made righteous and walk by his grace in newness of life, that is justly, before God and before man. And that, my brother and sister in Christ, is what it truly means to be justified. And so by this feast day, we learn or may learn that this inestimable gift of justification comes to you and me from the crucified and wounded side of Christ through the sacrament of baptism. <coughs> Excuse me. Hence, the sacrament of baptism properly administered is never in truth or in fact separated from the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ once for all offered upon the cross. Baptism is the normal means of Christ giving himself to you and to me through water in a new birth of regeneration by the Holy Spirit unto eternal life. It is the beginning in each of us of the rescue of the beauties of creation from the torments of fallen nature. As our Catholic faith has always taught, and as the Catechism continues to teach, baptism conforms us to the righteousness of God who makes us inwardly just by the power of his mercy. Its purpose is the glory of God and of Christ and the gift of eternal life. It is paramount that we understand that without this justification, we cannot be saved. And without baptism, we cannot be justified. This is why the Apostle Peter teaches emphatically, baptism now saves you. And this is why the Apostle Paul can write, but when the kindness and generous love of God our Savior appeared, not because of any righteous deeds we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the bath of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. That can be translated, he saved us through the bath of rebirth, even renewal by the Holy Spirit. Teaching us that the Holy Spirit is the operative agent in every baptism. So, even though because of the primordial catastrophe of original sin, we are fallen creatures indeed, far removed from God's original intention, oft times witness to the horrors of a fallen world in bondage to sin, sickness, corruption, and death. Yet, even now, because of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River, through the waters made holy by his most precious blood and applied to our lives through the sacrament of new birth, baptism, we may hear in this holy sacrifice of the Mass those life-giving words of God the Father's definitive pronouncement spoken from heaven, first and foremost over his only begotten Son, but then 
because of baptism over you and me. In the person and work of Jesus, our righteousness, Jesus, our justice. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.